Hi, I'm Mike Goldsworthy, and this is Unbreak the Planet, where we talk about what's really, really messed up in the world right now and bring in guests to help us find the solutions that we need right now. Grace, Grace Blakely, welcome. Uh, you're an economist. Uh, you're a, a political commentator uh, on economics. You used to write for New Statesman. Now it's Tribune. And uh, you've written a string of books and you have another one out. And, and according according to your Twitter, it, it currently says, I'm writing my next book, so I am making myself completely unavailable. Completely, except Com- for you. Exactly. Except so for you. <laughs> that, that was a brag I just had to get in. It's so good to be able to steal you away from your book writing. Welcome to the jungle. What's your book on? Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, So my book is basically about planning within capitalism. So it's kind of taking apart the distinction between free market capitalist societies on the on the one hand and, and centrally planned socialist ones on the other hand. And it's saying actually a lot of capitalist societies aren't really free market societies in the sense that a lot of the kind of decisions around the production and distribution of resources are made um, in quite centralized ways. So they're made by powerful financial institutions, big multinational corporations, powerful states. And so in that sense, a lot of what goes on within capitalism is actually planned. And my argument is that if there's planning going on, then it needs to be democratic. So we can't just have a bunch of wealthy and powerful people deciding who gets what. We need to be making sure that actually those decisions are subject to democratic accountability. Right. So a lot of people think that the way it works is there's this sort of like wild garden and it's better that if the the state the gardener is extremely minimal with it Mm. whereas actually what you're saying there's a whole team of big gardeners all tending and they're all the decision makers but they're removed from the public but you can't see them yeah exactly so the whole ideology of it exists to make sure that you can't see the people doing the work. So the whole system looks natural. And obviously, if the system looks natural, then it's harder to argue that it should be changed, right? Yeah. Um, whereas if you actually see all the ways in which the world that we live in, the economy that we live in, is very much constructed and planned by this very, very powerful elite, then you can say, right, well, they should be making these decisions differently. Yeah. So so um, small government is a misnomer because there's exactly. always a big government there because there's very well-structured governance of the system. Exactly. And we should have a say. Okay, great. So part of that is, is of course, how finances are managed around the world. And the subject for today is the, the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers and the Pandora Papers. What are, what are all these papers? Um, where do they come from? Are they related to each other? What is this Pandora's box of different papers that keep uh, emerging? Right, yeah. Well, they they come from different sources. And what they are effectively is just, um, you know, massive amounts of files that come from law firms, you know, financial institutions. Some of them have resulted from leaks. Some have resulted from hacks. The one that we've had most recently is the Pandora Papers. Mm-hmm. And what makes this different is just that it's bigger than all the ones that came before. So the Pandora Papers are 2.94 terabytes of information next to the Panama Papers. Papers, which are 2.6 terabytes, and the Paradise Papers, which are 1.4 terabytes. So it's just a huge amount of information. And what's happened is this information has been leaked and it's been sent to it. At this point, it was sent immediately to um, the ICIJ um, Mm -hmm. and the International International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. I think that's right. Um, And they basically trawled through all this information. It's imagine just having, you know, like loads and loads of emails and you're looking through it all to try and figure out who's done what, you know, where all the money's stashed away, who's Mm -hmm, spoken mm -hmm. to who. Um, and so they did that along with a, a bunch of different um, news agencies from around the world. And it's about 12 million documents each. It's a lot it? of stuff. Trawl. It's a yeah. lot of stuff. Yeah. So the first one, that that was um, the Panama Papers, and that was 2016. Yeah, April I think 2016. So. And that's the one where David Cameron got a little bit burnt for um, his father's um, assets or, or finances being based there. Then the, the Paradise Papers, that was next year, wasn't it? That was... 2017 and that was yeah i think so yeah yeah it was it was late 2017 that was a hack Mm. and then it's this month which the which is the pandora papers so i think i think with the first one the panama one there was um an unknown uh sort of whistleblower who went to a german paper Mm. um and then that german paper went to the icij and said what do we do with this and then the second one was a A hack. hack yeah 
that then also found its way to the ICIJ. Yeah. So the ICIJ is well, the is ICIJ now a home it obviously this. is you know it does investigative journalism. I think this actually a lot of this um, of these leaks really do show the importance of having really good investigative journalism, right? Because sure. it's something that as you know traditional media has kind of you know its dominance has been eroded. You need there's been less pro- money some for serious for it. expertise you to do. handle this. And kind the ICIJ has done a really good job because they've not only done all of the analysis, right? But they've really built a name for themselves in presenting the data yep. in a really interesting way. So you go on their website and it's like, you know, straight in there, really good graphics. It really kind of, you know, brings you in. It's not and just kind of boring they analysis. where their money from? I don't actually know where the ICIJ gets their money from. You would have thought That's some crowdfunding and yeah, some big end of it. You would hope they'd be transparent about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I'm they sure obviously they will be. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. no, I mean, they've done a really good job with yeah. it. And I think that's probably why, you know, successive rounds of, of papers have, have found their way to... To yeah, the ICIJ. It's now a, a yeah. safe home for all of that. Mm. And so, um, and this has caught and embarrassed quite a few individuals across businesses, yeah. across politics, yeah. even entertainers like Shakira. Shakira yeah. has, <laughs> has even been caught up in the most recent one. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. you know, what you're going to find, and there's certainly. Um, stories of individuals who have gone out of their way and particularly often politicians who've gone out of their way to kind of stash their assets offshore. But what you will often find actually is that most people who can afford to pay for tax planning or, you know, Mm -hmm. can afford to pay for um, advice about their financial affairs will end up, even if they don't necessarily know what's going on, having a lot of these arrangements being made, whether it's kind of like actual offshore dealings or whether it's kind of, you know, just tax efficient planning. So exploiting loopholes within the tax system. And that really exposes the role of these lawyers, financial planners, accountants in underpinning this system. Because the banks often get a lot of the heat, the ones that are doing the actual stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But a lot of what's come out here, and again with the Panama Papers as well, um, has really shown the role of of lawyers and accountants um, and these kind of, you know, people who are working beneath the surface to make this right. happen. Right, so the financial plan is the interface with the businesses or maybe the more naive celebrities mm. who then say later, you know, like, what, how am I involved in all of this? Yeah, I mean, probably been cases of it. Yeah, of course. And like, you know, if you want to make sure that you are really being not just like, you know, um, making sure that you're obeying the law when it comes to tax, but really being responsible when it comes to tax, you you have to speak to your accountant and say, this is the approach that I want to take to my taxes, because there will often be an assumption that you'll just want to minimize your tax burden as far as is possible within the boundaries of the law. Yeah. And a lot of people have been caught, you know, Jimmy Carr was obviously caught out from this. Like a lot of celebrities have been caught out from this, um, whereby perhaps if they had known what was going on and how bad it would be for their public image, if it got out, they might not have done it. They might have still done it, right? And I think there's a lot of people in yeah, this who it's, it's are very aware know. of what's They've going done on. It. And then if mm. it happens and they'll blame someone else. Exactly. So, so how... Let, let's let's walk through a scenario of how this might actually work. Like, so if I play the role of, you know, um, a HNWI, celeb, high net worth individual. Yeah, high net worth individual. I've just come into a lot of money and, and you're one of these uh, uh, tax planners or, or financial planners or advisors or lawyers. And I come to you and I say, uh, so Grace, um, yeah, my podcast has done really well and I've got like millions and millions, but I... Um, but that's going to cost a lot in taxes, isn't it? So um, what am I looking at here? What are my options? Well, there's loads you can do. Um, a, a big one that we've seen recently has just been you can set up a shell company somewhere where there's like a very low or zero corporate tax rate and then channel your money through that shell company. You may then set up a bunch of other shell companies down the line. And what that allows you to do is, is hide the beneficial ownership. So it's it's hiding who actually owns the company by basically having you know, um, a a random lawyer in a tax haven signed the papers to say, I have set up this business, but you are the beneficial owner. So you can set up a business, which, you know, the money gets channeled through, and then you can set up another one kind of below that and another one and another one. And the more layers you put in, the harder it's going to be to find out who is actually the beneficial owner of that that stream of money effectively. Right. Um, So So if I take um, all of my money from the bank, all 4.713 4.713 million and put it into you say I buy a company you or will, I transfer you can it sh- into set a company? up a shell company so I set up a company those assets I, I set up a company in 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 Switzerland or the United Arab Emirates or something probably more like the British Virgin Islands or, okay British yeah, Virgin like Islands that. and then who's the CEO of this company well you can have anyone being the the kind of management, as it were, of the company or the kind of, you know, um, yeah, like heading, heading it up on paper. 
the important thing is that the shell company hides the beneficial owner. And the beneficial owner is basically, as it says, so the person who be, benefits from the activities so of that company. So I would be the beneficial owner. I can donate my money to that company and then it can be managed by a team that ensure that it, it's invested there. Yeah, so your accountant earnings. or law firm or whatever is managing those assets on your behalf and the accounts all of them or whatever will then set up this shell company, get someone to sign on the dotted line saying this is my shell company. That shell company may then have, you know, set up another subsidiary right. shell company. And because it's not based in the UK, then then gains that it makes, like capital yeah. gains, they're not taxed then. Well, yeah. So and basically all of that money will be able to be, well, you'll be able to avoid tax in various different ways. But, but the big how, thing is, then how the big, do I get the big, it to the big thing is like that if I want to go and buy a new boat or, or, or a car, then how do I get that money if it's if it's a business in another country? How do I get that to me? Does it have to go through my HSBC or TSB? Well, I mean, or do I get look, a credit card? Look at what like from... Tony and Cherie Blair did, for example. They okay. set off an offshore, offshore shell company, and then they used that company to purchase the asset that they wanted to purchase. So the money's right. in the company, and then they can use the company to buy the things that they need to buy. So the company can um, buy me a yacht, or the company yeah, well, can exactly. buy me a car. And the big the big thing here, right, um, is it's less necessarily about the structure of that particular arrangement because there's lots of different arrangements that you could do you could set mm -hmm. up a trust like lots of different stuff you can do the most important thing isn't actually the structure it's the secrecy right and the places that you want to go are yes the places with like zero percent corporate tax rates but they're also the places that have very very loose laws around transparency and around financial transparency because the big thing there is like ultimately even if you've set up a million shell companies if they all have your name on it mm -hmm. then your government can say oh right well this is actually money that should be taxed here and it's all the way over there so then, so then what then can claim the government do, do about it well it can't do anything about it because it doesn't really know what's going on and this is what's so, at the centre of all these arrangements but if they knew that it was owned by me if if if, well, then that would be... If I went la la li la la, I've got a company in the British Virgin Islands which is buying me uh, a new Ferrari every month. Yeah, well, then they would think, well, that's, a, you know, that's you avoiding, potentially evading tax and come after you for it. Potentially, right. do, you know, depending on what the so, nature of the so arrangement is, depending on whether or so not it's, it's illegal actually, or legal. So it's actually and illegal also, then to do that. Well, I mean, you know, it really depends on where you are and how you're doing it. Again, the whole thing is quite like a, a grey area. Yeah. In terms of the actual avoidance or evasion, because, you know, what you're doing when you're setting up all of these companies in all these different places is subjecting that company to lots of different kinds of law, right? So okay. depending right. on what the, the legal system of the country that you're kind of incorporating in is, and depending on what the legal system of the country where the beneficial owner is, mm -hmm. then... You know, it may be illegal. It may just be a grey zone. It may just be immoral. And also, so if again, I transfer the, the money is, out, saying I'm paying for a, for a service, and then people don't know exactly what I paid for, then they just can't trace it. But if I say, well, the I'm point about whether or not they can, and they know that it's going to my shell company, which then buys me cars. Well, the point saying, about whether or not they can trace it is literally just about whether or not they know who the beneficial owner is, right? Right. And so, if you don't know who the beneficial owner is, because you've got shell company after shell company after shell company all set up with name after name after name of different random person, then it's going to be impossible really for any tax authority to be able to look back. And not just impossible because of the comp complexity, impossible because there are countries whose entire kind of business model rests on the fact that they will not let uh, the banks that are managing your finances tell your government where the tax where yeah. their taxes are. So Switzerland, for example, was like the one of the worst in the world for this up until recently where there's been a little bit more um, of a spotlight on Switzerland mm. uh, where they would literally just refuse to cooperate even when it was cases of, you know, um, like money laundering, um, drug money, like human trafficking, there were like arms right. dealing, where there was really like, you know, where literally like Interpol or like, you know, um, the police or authorities were involved. There were such strict rules around banking secrecy that yeah. it would it was basically getting in the way of criminal investigations Crikey. so secrecy is the really really big and thing the here. benefit to the country is that they have bankers in that country that make big money of handling bankers this lawyers accountants it creates but employment. do the public of the country get any benefit from this not it really creates some employment but you would imagine it's global employment and again you know level. you've literally got some of these countries where they've got you know the most number of companies incorporated in that country in the world and all that's there is an office 
maybe employing one guy who signs all the papers and then a bunch of like cleaning staff or whatever. Right. It's a very so if little it, benefit if it to that, doesn't, that If it doesn't benefit the country as a whole to host this, um, you know, money protection services, then why do they do it? Because it still benefits elites. It still benefits, you know, um, often the governments of those countries will have very close links with some of the law firms and some of the banks and other institutions that are doing a lot of this stuff. I mean, like, you know, for us, for the UK, it doesn't particularly benefit us to be host to the City of London Corporation, which actually, when you look at it in terms of the the network of tax avoidance and evasion, the City of London Corporation is the second largest conduit or facilitator of tax avoidance in the world. Yep. So that's undermining after, our tax base. It's also creating these problems the around financial instability. The Netherlands. Right. Oh, um, really? Yeah. As, as a conduit. So there's two, this particular investigative report How looked into, the well, because it's a massive, off, it's a massive financial center. The big, right. the, these okay. big places are places where the big investment banks, yep. you know, ho host themselves and therefore mm. where a lot of the deals go through. Um, so yeah, two two kinds of uh, of tax haven. I think this is a really important distinction to make because often the the places that come up on these lists of tax havens are the British Virgin Islands, you know, the Cayman Islands, wherever, and it, mm -hmm. it brings out these. This is where, where the the you know this name tax haven comes from. Um, but actually, the places that are facilitating that tax avoidance and evasion are the kind of big you know, um, advanced economies like the UK, the city of London, the Netherlands. Also in this round of leaks, we saw that South Dakota in the US yeah, is I a huge, huge- It's getting in yeah, on the game. Exactly. Yeah. And th there's a really interesting story there. And again, the ICIJ have done some really interesting work looking at basically how legislators within the South Dakota legislature um, were basically captured by these kind of like mm. financial interests by basically people who had worked in this sector and slowly kind of under the radar, all these laws were pushed that basically made this place into the center for right. this, this center for tax avoidance and evasion. Um, Delaware was another one that tried to do this in the US. So the US itself is actually a big place where a lot of this money ends up, but often it goes through the city or the Netherlands or all these other big financial right. centers. So, so um, America as a whole is getting more into the game. They're seeing yeah. it being stashed in lots of different places and thinking, well, we've got state level law that can help us do this. Why should all these other places be the beneficiary? And so it's like a global rot that you, you can see getting going because if there's money associated with it on that elite level, like you're saying, then obviously it's weaving its way into the influencers and the politicians. And, and this is actually what corruption means, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And like um, the, like a, a big thing at the moment that we're seeing going on is regulation in response to each of these rounds of links, mm -hmm. uh, these leaks, sorry. Um, it's kind of like pushing on a balloon, right? So you regulate something that's happening somewhere, yep. say banking secrecy in Switzerland or wherever, and the money is then just pushed somewhere else. So actually what came out a lot during this round of leaks in terms of all the emails was uh, businesses, financial advisors, mm -hmm. advising their clients to move money to different parts, so, say out of Panama, mm -hmm. because of all the heat that was on Panama after the Panama Papers and into another place. And, you know, maybe that was ended up being in America or, you know, another part of the world. So it's difficult to regulate because as soon as you clamp down on one area, the then money I'm goes imagine, somewhere else. And probably the same experts and knowledge just <laughs> go, exactly. and, go and get nice jets yeah, up yeah, to yeah. another place yeah. where they can stretch their legs and um yeah exactly so Mossack Fonseca yeah. which was the firm that was really implicated in the Panama Papers yes. has just basically changed its business model slightly even after all of the massive massive heat that it came under during that there was even like a Netflix documentary that looked into um yeah looked into no the one knew Papers. who that company was yeah and then suddenly and like for, for example in, in the newest ones the the Pandora Papers they associate the value of money there between what $5.6 trillion and $32 yeah, trillion. Yeah, that's all of the money that's held potentially offshore. That's yeah. what the ICIJ estimates is the amount of money that could be held offshore. Yeah. It's the IMF. So if that were to be taxed, then there's a lot that... Yeah, the IMF estimates that. that it's $600 billion each year that are lost in taxes as a result of offshore, offshore um, arrangements. Yeah, and so when you've got growing inequality in all of these countries, that's got to wind people up. Yeah. I mean, before the show, you were telling me about there's more and more people um, have their own businesses and are actually needing to make those those tax declarations because it's not coming out automatically. You see it at the end of every year. And that's what I'm putting mm. in. And then they think about 
<laughs> all of their little amounts sort of trying to hold up a country when they're these big chunks that are that are walking away scot free with with a lot more than they actually need in order to get their occasional foot massage or whatever, right? Yeah. Why aren't we seeing more outrage than we're seeing at the moment? I mean, that that is the big question. And I think partly the, the annoying thing about this is every time this happens, people seem more and more kind of inured to the idea that this is just what the rich are doing. And I think there is a certain amount of just cynicism yeah. at the moment, which is basically undermining our collective outrage because there is just a sense that, oh yeah, that's just how the world works now. And the big problem, to be honest, the reason that I think actually there's, if anything, been less, there's been a kind of collective shrug when it's come to this round, particularly in the UK. The reason I think there's been less outrage is because there is not an opposition that is standing up and taking advantage of this stuff and saying, these guys are, you know, pursuing these things and, you know, pursuing these behaviors, doing these things. It's unforgivable. This is the legislation. This is the policy that we're going to put forward to actually change it. We haven't really had any of that because it's seen as too political. You don't want to come after the rich if you're, you know, um, have, you've kind of put together this argument that basically the problem with the Labour Party is that it's too far to the left, right? Mm. Whereas actually, the vast majority of people want to see action on tax avoidance and evasion. So, so has many there people been such polling that, on that? Um, yeah, there will have been. I don't actually have any numbers off the top of my head. But we know that like David Cameron... Um, made this his big thing at the G7. He was like, in the, all the um, those big international meetings, he was yeah, like, we need to clamp down alert. on avoidance and evasion. And then himself yeah. got implicated in it, of course. But yeah, we know then, that this is a big, big political then, issue. And then since then, getting involved in all the lobbying of um, public money Green to sale, other yeah. businesses mm. that are then going to go and stash them in yeah. tax havens. I mean, you can understand why people get jaded. You know, they're trying to make ends meet. They're worrying about heat and eat, a lot of people at the moment. And they've got zero power to do anything about this. Um, and if you say it's not even a voting option for them because it's not being challenged, mm. then it's like boiling the frog because it's kind of yeah. like, you know, Panama Papers, shock, yeah. Paradise Papers. Oh my God, there's more. Pandora Papers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know the story. Yeah. And so, and so where do you go from there? Well, I mean, you know, as with any of these issues, right, I think a lot of people assume that all that one needs to do to turn something into a kind of political hot potato is just expose it. Yep. But that really isn't the case. You can expose wrongdoing as much as you like, but unless you are able to translate that into a movement for change, then nothing is going to change. And this is the kind of story that you see in regimes that have been dealing with corruption forever. You know, it just becomes part of the way that politics works and people just accept it, right? Yeah, play um, along with it so yeah. that they don't constantly sit there being tense about something being wrong, something being wrong. Exactly. At the end of the day, they just give up and say, okay, fine, what's my cut? Yeah, exactly. Um, and that is, you know, the danger I think that we're we're going into at the moment because we've had this like long, long period of Conservative Party dominance because the Labour Party is in a shambles and it doesn't look like they're going to win the next election. You know, the Conservative Party is basically able to say, we run the country and the only thing that they're going to respond to is kind of pressure from their donors, pressure from some sections of the electorate when it feels, you know, important to them. Doesn't it um, bother the Conservative Party? party or its base at all? I mean, I'm sure that it does bother some sections of the Conservative Party base because this is an issue that we know bothers people across society, right? Um, but the question is, I suppose, what the rules that are brought in to respond to that change are. The big thing that came out of this particular round was the role of the UK property market mm -hmm. in sustaining these forms of tax avoidance and evasion. And the UK property market is just, I mean, it is a, we know that it is a sink for dirty money from all over the world. Yeah. Um, and we also know that um, it is kind of central to the UK's business model, really, like capital gains from property, um, you know, the links between the banking system and, and real estate. All of these things are central to the way that our economy works, right? And they're also very important determinants of voting behaviour. So landlords... The Conservative Party has created something like 700,000 new landlords over the course of the last decade. The vast majority of those people will vote Conservative. Uh, when it comes to homeowners, again, that is a big determinant of, whether, of, of how you vote. Most homeowners vote Conservative. Uh, most private renters vote Labour. So a lot of the Conservative Party's base 
has a vested interest in making sure that there is not too much substantial change to the way that the UK property market works, right? right? So if, for example, foreign money flowing into UK property is a big determinant of property prices, particularly in cities, it pushing it up, yep. exactly, which we know that it is, then shutting off that tap is potentially actually not going to be something that is in the interest of people who have a lot of money in property. Interesting. Right? Yep. So there are there are genuine political economic reasons why this might not actually Which be in the interest of Which is a very, very British party. thing to chuck all of your money into a property and then all new money that you get doing up yeah, your property. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, you know, that's, that's, you know, how, how a lot of people live. It's also worth bearing in mind that a lot of Tory party donors have been implicated in in these, uh, these rounds of tax evasion. So it's often just an assumption, I think, among the elite that actually you're not going to have to pay that much but tax. But how, how much can anything be fixed at a national level if... Mm if you're squeezing the balloon at one end and then it goes elsewhere? Well, I mean, a lot can be done at the national level, particularly when you're a country that hosts the second biggest like conduit for, for this kind of dirty money in the world. So clamping down on the city of London would make a huge difference because a lot of the banks that are facilitating this stuff in other parts of the world, a lot of the financial institutions, law firms are headquartered here. Mm. Similarly in the US, Biden has said this has been a bit, bit of an embarrassment for Biden because he's been saying we're going to clamp down on this stuff. And actually under, well, not really under his watch, but certainly since he's been in power, not, nothing has been done about it really. Um, so, you know, if the US and the UK, for example, were actually as, as hosts of the biggest financial centers in the world were to do something about this, that would create a lot of problems. Not necessarily because all of the money is ending up in these countries, but because the financial institutions, law firms, accountancy firms that are facilitating this these the big are headquartered. Exactly. Yeah. So if, you know, there was legislation that really allowed these institutions to be prosecuted when this stuff was brought to light, that would make a big difference. So what about if, for example, Biden wanted to put the squeeze on the UK for this? Like the, the UK didn't want to because they want to protect their own interests, let's say, or, or the Conservative Party does, you know, mm. for example. What can the US do, or maybe the US and the EU together or whatever, in order to um, pressure the UK to clean up the City of London? Well, I mean, we've already seen, let's just take, for example, the issue of, of corporate tax rates, right? We've already seen um, this agreement that has happened this year uh, for basically a kind of minimum level of corporation tax all over the world. And obviously this is a big part of how tax evasion works is that you can find somewhere with a 0% corporate tax rate and set up a shell company there, or you can do, you know, you can do it in a much more obvious way. Like a lot of the big tech firms have done with Ireland, right? Mm -hmm. They just go to the place where they can pay the lowest level of tax. So having that, like that base level of tax around the world is, is a good start. Um, how do you enforce that? Just by sign up? Well, yeah, all the countries agree to sign up, right? Okay. And this is... And then if they decide to break that further on down the line, because like international law, hey, what's that? Well, then, I mean, this is the reason that this came about in the first place, right? Because there's been a long, an ongoing um, set of arrangements that have been um, being negotiated by the OECD called the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting um, like rules, basically, BEPS. Right. Um, and that process has been going on for a long time. It's called BEPS. BEPS. Oh, BEPS. BEPS. Yeah. The base erosion. Yeah, exactly. And was kind of being undermined, basically, because lots of countries were refusing to sign up. Um, and then eventually it did come out, but it didn't go as far as, as many people wanted. Uh, what then started to happen was, so the UK, for example, imposed this, um, this digital services tax, which yeah. was basically seen as... Um, a way of trying to make sure that largely US tax companies paid tax in the UK. For the France, services they provide in exactly. the UK. Yep. France did a similar thing. So you so started it's to see- taxing at the point of service. Exactly. Because otherwise yeah. you're, you're in the economy of a country, but you're not being taxed by that country because you're based You're elsewhere. repatriating your profits. So the idea your... is kind of like, if you're active in this country- you get charged based on your activity in the country. Yeah, basically. Um, and it can be calculated on a number of different measures. But yeah, that's effectively the idea. Um, and because there was that unilateral action. So this is, I think, the interesting point is that people often say, oh, well, you can't do anything as one country. But actually, unilateral action is often what precipitates multilateral action. Interesting. Because you start seeing com com countries saying, right, well, we're going to tax US tech giants. And then the US comes back and says, this was actually a big part of the the trade war. Mm -hmm. um, it was why Trump got, was getting very annoyed at Europe. It was partly that, partly all the antitrust investigations. Um, and it really kind of put some 
steam into the sails of some wind into the sails of uh, these international negotiations. And then we ended up after obviously getting some elections where, you know, obviously the president of the US changed, which was a big help, um, where there was much more of an incentive to actually sign up to this new set of arrangements. And these new sets of arrangements, by the way, don't go far enough, but they are a step in the right direction. So I think this this argument basically that, oh, we can't do anything about it because we're just one country. So there's no point putting pressure on our legislature during elections and outside of elections to really pay attention to this issue. I don't think that's right because um, we have seen you know, a fair amount change as a result of pressure that has been brought to bear on uh, on individual countries. So how do you think um, you can then get voters in different countries more um, engaged in this issue? Like, And seeing it is basically um, a proportion of tax that's being robbed from them, but something that can be fixed. How, how do you get that there? Because, I mean, when you get scenarios like... Boris Johnson goes, you know, sauntering off on a holiday mm. to his mate's villa, who happens to be a lord who lost his, this is that goldsmith, yeah. who lost his seat in an election, but then got back into the cabinet by by going through the House of Wards, being made a lord. And then he says, Boris Johnson, come and stay in my villa. And then the finances, I think, associated with that villa were were tied to the uh, Pandora Papers, mm. weren't they? What was the, do you know the link there? I don't actually know, but... Yeah, I, but, that is that is true. <laughs> yeah, that is, I don't know at all. But that's <laughs> no, true. no, I know I've heard that. That yeah, that is true. So then, uh, how? Because people can see before their eyes, you know, how this this you scratch my back, I scratch your back, chummy system works. How do you say? Well, here's a real tangible thing that stops that, but also makes life better for you. Yeah, I mean, this is um, this is a difficult issue to to politicize, I suppose, because as we've just been saying, like people are very cynical, yeah. and there will they just be a sense that they associate it more with the Tory party. And so, hey, if I'm a Tory party voter and I'm thinking, well, actually, money going into the Tory party means that good, I get the better financial managers again and again in power, mm. and we don't have those those crazy, you know, Labour people that will trash the economy because Labour always trashes the economy. Then I might feel, you know, an underlying comfort that mm. they're bunkering in. I mean, in I think like more. if you ask most people about this issue, most of them will say they are uncomfortable with it, right? There will be a few people who will be comfortable with it for those reasons and for other reasons, including the fact that they benefited from it financially. The big issue is not, you know a big question mark as to whether or not this is right or wrong. The big issue is what can we do about it, right? And most people feel powerless and they're supposed to feel powerless. You know, a big part of the um, economic and political shift that we've had over the last 40 years towards neoliberalism um, has been about undermining democracy, basically. Kind of taking lots of areas of decision-making within the state and placing them as far away as possible from the hands of, you know, the average person. Right. Um, and that is supposed to make you feel disempowered. It's supposed to make you feel like the decisions that are being made about your life are kind of outside of your reach to be you able to influence. You say it's supposed to make you feel. You think that's by design. Yeah. You don't, you really do. Absolutely. So, if you look so, at, say, for so example, the changes those... to like local government, um, the centralization of power, the removal of things like, you know. Sure. But isn't that just people taking power in order to put them in the hands of those that they trust and they maybe trust businesses more? But that's the more. same thing. Yeah. It's the same but thing. You, you're saying you basically said these decisions should be insulated done, from democratic accountability. But you're saying that it should be done in order to make some people feel powerless. Yeah, that's the same thing. Making some people, you know, power most of the time is a zero sum game. Right. When you're taking power away from someone and to give it to someone else. Yeah. Those are two sides of the same coin. Yeah. So when you're centralizing political power in a in an economy, you are or in a country, you are doing so to take power away from some people and to give it to other people. Yeah. So I get the bit by you're making a choice that power should lie with your mates rather than like the, the common people who whose judgment you don't trust. Yeah. But there's that extra element which you implied, which is this is not just a deliberate strategy to shift power, but it is also to demoralize those people who may have had power before so that they just accept the situation, so that they they lose mechanisms that they feel empower them. Yeah, I mean, I think those are basically the same thing, right? If you are living in a system where which you see power being 
centralized power being taken away from you where, you know, for example, in your workplace, a great example of this actually is just the war on the labor movement that took place during the 1980s, right? When Thatcher came for the unions, it was both to remove a block that yeah. was preventing her from implementing the policies that she wanted to implement. And it was also to basically stop making people feel like they had any control over what went on in their workplaces. Right. Stop making people feel like there was any point in organizing so, to so get better paying conditions. So that's the duality of it, not just removing power now, but also removing not the will to live, but yeah. <laughs> but the will to protest. The will to, to want to change things, exactly. Well, that, that's And that's the same with the policing bill recently as that's well. That's what I was just going mm. to come on to. So... It's not, so you're saying these these movements in power are not just about to place power with the people that you trust more, but it's also com complemented by deliberate measures to make people feel as though they don't have any roots to yeah. power, that they can't change things. Um, so to take away their their willingness uh, to get active and to and to start disrupting exactly, and that is actually I think what a lot of the kind of you know that's an extra commas... charge. That that's really quite an extra charge because that that moves it from kind of like I think the system is managed better like this than like this. Yeah, I mean, well, Thatcher said objective. this herself when she was Did she, know? she said you know the method is economics, the object is to change the soul. The whole idea was about creating a new kind of subjectivity within these societies, whereby rather than saying having a social safety net, social housing, a labor movement, rather than having a sense of collective solidarity that provided you with a sense of identity and a mechanism to engage with power, it was about creating individuals who, who you know, um, rather than relying on, on the collective, rather than relying on the public sector, would be, have to rely on themselves, their own savings, mm -hmm. their own property, right. um, in order to ensure themselves against lifetime risks, who would have to rely on kind of competition in order sure. to secure their place in in the system rather than um right. like solidarity and, and that sort of so stuff cooperation to get this this absolutely clear those politicians and financial interests that want to move more power into their hands of, of their mates and away from um, mechanisms in the wider public are doing it not just for more financial control and more power control, but actually it's deliberately anti-democratic yeah. because they're deliberately trying to break the soul of democracy so that people feel more disempowered. Certainly the ones that know what they're doing. You know, I'm not a mind reader. I'm not in the position to judge why anyone's doing anything. But when you look at the remarks that have been made by politicians like Thatcher, lots of kind of neoliberal economists when they've been setting up this system, it has been about making sure that a, the average person has no power over a lot of the decisions that affect their lives because they don't trust the judgment of the average person because they don't because trust the average the, the average person interferes with them feathering their own nests because they don't trust the judgment of the average person and because it is in their interest to have a society in which you know democracy is limited if you look at for example some of the early neoliberal economists their whole argument um, was that there are certain areas of um, policy that should never be subject to democratic accountability. Right. So that there was this idea okay. that there's a split between, at the global level, two realms. And this was Carl Schmitt's dichotomy, Imperium and Dominium. Mm -hmm. And one of them is about, um, you know, kind of uh, politics and culture and, um, you know, like those kinds of political and social areas of policy. Gotcha. And the other one is about property. And right. that basically the argument of the neoliberal economists was that, that there should be global rules that govern the um, ownership of property and um, yeah, basically kind of, you know, property rules and, and contracts and mm -hmm. those sorts of things. And those rules should be entirely outside of democratic control. So you should not be able as a public to vote for things like nationalization or the expropriation of resources or, you know, particular changes to property rights, intellectual property rights, whatever. Those things should be outside of democratic control to protect the interests of these people and to make sure that democracy is limited to these other issues. So to give yeah. people the sense that they're in control while actually never really allowing them to be so in control. the fundamental structures of capitalism are um, inherited and controlled by those that know and those that are in the club. Um, and democracy is for, you know, the everyday political wash of, of small decisions about like smaller people's lives. Yeah. So they have their domain of kind of like how you want to live, but we have our domain of the system within exactly. which you live. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's 
So that's what they kind of want us to believe. They want us to believe that there is this separate set of rules and that those rules are untouchable. And I think a lot of people do believe that mm -hmm. largely because it has become so difficult to exercise any voice or any like, power like, within our like democracy. Like the laws of physics. This is just the exactly. way economics works. Exactly. Yeah. Our job is really to show that those but, rules are contingent and we can change them. That's the also, only way you'll get but things But also to there, there's, there's an implication there that if you say these are the rules of economics and this is how it works, it's got the strong implication of a stable system that stays stable uh, down generations and down centuries. Yeah. Whereas when you see vastly growing inequality mm. just down a few generations, you can say, well, this isn't a stable framework that holds and holds and holds. You can see that it's being stretched. It's already distorting. It's it's going on a runaway evolution, we exactly. say in biology. Yeah. And, and it's becoming something very different from what it was back in the 50s or back in the 60s. So it isn't universal immutable laws. It is looking more and more like a scam system. Yeah. And to use that language around like complex systems, rather than having, you know, econ uh, economics works on the assumption that the that macroeconomic systems tend, to, tend towards equilibrium, right? So if, you know, yeah. Prices go up in one area. Everything is supply. in balance. Exactly. Things will balance out. And so out. this indicates there's something out of kilter because the balance is being lost. This, the economy is not a simple system that tends towards equilibrium to the extent that you can really speak of the economy. But the world economy um, is a complex system yeah. and it is subject to non-linearity, to feedback dynamics. And the big feedback that economics misses out is the feedback between economic and political power. And mm -hmm. this is why you start seeing consistently rising inequality across the decades because as economic inequality increases, as income and wealth inequality increases, you have a group of people who have so much wealth and power that they're able to influence politics. Yep. And when they can influence politics, they can change laws that make economic inequality increase, that allow them to increase their share of the pie. And that creates this positively reinforcing yep. cycle that we've really seen ever since the 1970s, when you had those policies introduced that broke the power of the labor movement and that broke a lot of those rules that yep. governed international So that economics. whole concept of trickle down doesn't exist. It's actually trickle up because you only employ someone if they're going to make more money for you than they cost. So the money goes up. And then when those people who have the money accelerate, accelerate that by then reducing taxes for themselves, that accelerates the trickle up and then you get this big distortion. And on what you were just saying there, um, or what we were just discussing with that with that growing inequality, Andrew Neal tweeted yeah. this this morning. Um, he just said, top 1% of US households now hold a larger share of US wealth, 27%, than the entire middle class, 26.6%. Federal Reserve data, lowest share of national wealth held by U.S. middle class, defined as middle 60% of U.S. households by income on record. Or to put it in other ways, you've got 60% in the bulk of the population holding 26.6% of the money, and then the top 1% holding more money than the whole of middle America, as it's classically defined. Mm. And this is the first time we've seen that. That shows the rising inequality. And we know in the U.S., that when laws are made at states level, there is zero correlation with what the um, bottom 90% of people want, zero correlation, and a strong correlation with what the top 10% want. Mm. So what you were just saying about how that accumulated wealth then gets into the political power, it's all, it's all quite clearly there now. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, a big thing here when we think about wealth inequality, I think wealth inequality is going to become the big political hot potato mm. and in this the post-pandemic world. More, as you can see the with reason, the Panama Papers, the, the reason Paradise that it's happened and, yeah. is largely central bank policy, right? Right. So central okay. banks are, again, these were institutions that were formerly within the realm of kind of democratic control because they were kind of, you know, under the, the influence or control of, of treasuries. Yep. In the 1980s and 90s, a lot of central banks were made independent, including the Bank of England, which meant that they were given a mandate by the government, but they were told, you go away and you, you meet that mandate however you want. And this was largely through, you know, basically the way that monetary policy works. So setting interest rates, um, mm -hmm. you know, financial regulation, those sorts of things. Um, and what we've seen happen over the last kind of 20 years-ish, 20, 30 years, has been that, when central banks were removed from democratic accountability, rather than just becoming these kind of neutral technocrats, mm -hmm. they were captured 
by various different kinds of interests, particularly in the financial sector. Um, and this was reflected in, for example, in the UK. Uh, there was a great um, article that was written by Tom Hazeldine looking at uh, the North-South divide. And he gets a quote uh, where the governor of the Bank of England basically says that unemployment in the North is a small place to play for controlling inflation in the South. So that's a distributed decision that this central bank is making, and it's not being subject to democratic accountability. The big thing that's happening at the moment is quantitative easing, is the central banks are creating new money and using that money to purchase assets from the private sector. So they're purchasing, say, government bonds or also increasingly corporate bonds from private investors. And the idea being that that, you know, then changes a, 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 an illiquid asset for a liquid asset, pumps liquidity into the system. Those investors take that cash and use it to purchase other assets, which is why we've seen massive inflation in, um, you know, stock uh, in stocks and shares in property uh falling bond yields basically lots and lots of money in right. their system and that money has boosted asset values so people who own assets property shares whatever have seen their wealth increase as a result of a set of policies that have been pursued by our governments yep so the the role of the central bank i mean what's their targets is it is it keeping inflation under control and helping grow gdp it's generally and it varies from central bank to central bank but it's generally keeping inflation within a certain boundary right mm -hmm. um and so uh a big problem since the financial crisis has not been inflation it's been stagnant levels of inflation or deflation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and what this suggests is that basically there's this issue of, of secular stagnation, um, which implies, so the technical definition for it is that there is a, a negative real interest rate or a zero real interest rate is required to equilibrate saving and investment and maintain a uh, maintain full employment. Right. Um, so basically that you need weird, uh, weird um, kind of monetary policy to allow a country to maintain full employment. And that is unusual in the sense that usually central banks would have been able to kind of have a, you know, a point on interest rates or reduce interest rates a little bit okay. in order to make sure that you've got that balance between inflation and unemployment. But today, because we have this huge amount of stagnation, and there's a, a lot of reasons for that, which we won't go into now because it's, it's a bit complicated, but because basically our economic systems are less dynamic than they were in the past. They're growing less fast. Productivity is, is lower. You need to basically constantly kind of make money easier and easier and easier. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it just about keeps growth ticking along, but it also but is a massive GDP giveaway growth. from the wealthy. Exactly. And it and so as far as if you're concerned with GDP growth and it's easier to get that GDP growth from the top, then you don't need to bother with the bottom sort of 90%, 80% or 70%. You can just focus there and then you get your your overall headline stats. Mm. And then that provides confidence for companies that may want to invest in your country and so forth and so on. So there's a lot of neglect then. Yeah, I so, mean, the big problem there is like um, how you create good employment that is associated with wage growth. Mm -hmm. um, and actually and secure employment, growth, exactly, so and productivity growth. real wage growth yeah. rather than just inflated wage growth. So, so putting all of this together then, um, we're saying that a system has developed, a runaway system, whereby there are more and more mechanisms for the rich to um, avoid tax and stash their money, and that helps them influence policy. And even now the central banks have, because of the metrics that they need to pursue, in interest in, in propping up um, the wealthy and where the big money sits. And even though people know this and they're annoyed about this and they think it's wrong, it's they think it's beyond their control. So then what is it that we need to do in order to bring this back in? And I and I will I note something that's been done because with the uh with the Panama papers, there was the Panama Gate case mm. where the um the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Nawaz Sharif, um, he, he there was a decision by the Supreme Court in Pakistan that he couldn't hold public office right, yeah. based on the, the Panama Papers. So there was, you can take strong action to say, we don't like your behavior. We don't want this mm -hmm. kind of, of money stashing involved in our politics or political influences. If you do that, you get disqualified from having a say in power. But this is not a very well-known case outside mm. Pakistan, as, as, as far as I'm aware. So why aren't we doing that elsewhere? Why aren't we having, you know, take down examples, you know, big wins that can then get the public saying, 
oh yeah, if that were done more, then they'd be right in on yeah. thinking that they can I mean, help fix the system. Because it's basically not in the interest of the people in power to make sure that anyone is really prosecuted for this. So uh, I think it was after one of the, either the Panama or the Paradise Papers, um, uh, the Conservatives set up this kind of economic crimes unit that basically it was about kind of trying to figure out who was doing something wrong and then prosecuting them. But it hasn't brought any cases the forward. ECU. Yeah, <laughs> it hasn't brought any cases forward. Um, and no one's been prosecuted for any of this stuff so far in the UK. And, and it would you say that that again is more um, sort of twiddling thumbs in order to demoralise yeah, people? Yeah, to just kind Having of... Having a stab at doing something, but doing it so weakly, it's like, Ugh, Yeah, exactly, tried, it's kind of make really it look like something's happening this. and yeah. therefore you take the steam out of the sails of those people who are like pushing for yeah. action. So um, you the, really I think, think you know, that there's the, a lot of deliberate cynicism in this. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, look, all you have to do is look back to the financial crisis of 2008, right? When it was very, very clear that in the US and the UK, there had been pervasive wrongdoing, um, whether or not that was, um, you know, actually fraudulent or illegal, or just kind of a massive dereliction of duty. No one was sent to prison. And one person I think was actually sent to prison. Um, Iceland, jailed a load of people. There are a few countries that jailed a load of people. And in doing so, they had much quicker recoveries because basically trust was restored to an extent in the, in the financial yeah. system. We have refused consistently, not just in each of these cases of, of tax avoidance and evasion, but in almost every scandal that we've seen in recent years, whether that's the financial crisis, whether it's, um, you know, uh, like all all of these different crises that we've seen take place um, in recent years, the Greensill scandal, um, all of the kind of Tory corruption scandals, no one really ends up getting into trouble. And so that is what really undermines public totally. trust in all yeah. of our institutions. And we know that public trust in our political and economic institutions is declining year on sure, year on because year. Because people say, oh, here we go again. Exactly. So there's a lot of stuff we can do in terms of policy. Um, I'd really actually recommend people looking into the work of Tax Justice UK and the Tax Justice Network to look at the policies that we can pursue to deal with this. I know that they have this idea of... Um, of ABCs, the ABCs of tax avoidance and evasion mm -hmm. internationally. So that's the automatic exchange of information, um, the revealing beneficial ownership. That's that thing about secrecy yep. and doing country by country reporting. So that's basically multinationals reporting where they make their taxes, where they make their money, sorry. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of rules that you can push at the parliamentary legislative level to make that happen. But I think the big thing to take away from this is not just we could do X and Y and Z in terms of policy because who are we going to get to do it? The big thing here and is actually organising, getting involved in political movements and putting pressure, particularly on political parties that are supposed to represent the interests of, of ordinary people to say, this should be a big central issue. For the Labour Party in the UK, this should be a big central issue. For Joe Biden in the US, this should be a big central issue. Do you think that we need some scalps, that we need to like have some scalps of some people whereby the public can go, yes, excellent, they got that corrupt person, they got I that dodgy. I actually don't think... Because if you think, if you think, for example, to the expenses scandal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when, when that, you know, there was the, 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 the duck house and the duck pond or whatever, you know, even for small things, you know, the public wanted Atom because they knew that they had decent salaries, they knew that they were privileged and actually seeing them called out and punished was something that that then shook up the system. So do we need that again? You don't think that's going to be effective? I actually don't think that just having scalps is that effective because it reinforces this narrative that this is about a few bad individuals rather than a fundamentally corrupt system. And when, you know, in response to um, the, the expenses scandal, you actually just saw public trust in MPs, in, in politics in general, decline and not really recover. And that was because there was this sense that, right, okay, so we've got these scalps, but nothing's really changed. A lot of the people actually who were implicated in that are still in, in or around power. Got, and yeah. it just reinforced this sense of like, oh yeah, you know, really Have you can a get scandal. a few bad apples, they all, but the they system all get is... slapped on the wrist. Exactly, but the system is fundamentally we, broken. Yeah, yeah, carry on in the same. I think what we really need to be calling for is not just, and actually I don't necessarily think, it's often useful to have individuals you know, brought to the forward and say this is an example of a wider yeah, problem. Because there's, there's but, gotta be a there's gotta be an I've had enough point. Yeah, I mean I just don't think that like having a bunch of individuals brought forward and blamed as individuals 
is 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 as helpful as identifying the individuals who've done wrong, punishing them and saying, right, and this is going to lead to systemic change. So these are all the ways that we're so changing the system. So you think that probably a better way is to go to the Labour Party and say, Labour Party, do a calculation of how much money you will have if all of this is fixed and what that will mean on a constituency level or a regional level or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think get, that we Get need a red to be... bus and say, we give tax yeah. avoiders um, X billion a year. We could spend that on the NHS instead. Exactly, like that. And also, I mean, you know, it doesn't just have to be the Labour Party because I know people are very kind of, you know, disillusioned with the Labour Party at the moment. I think there's a lot of work that can be done to make this a public and political issue and just not let it go. So a lot of campaigning organizations um, are like working really hard to get this into the into the like public sphere, but they need support. It needs to be something that people seem to be interested in. Right? Is this something that I say we, but kind of like campaigners who are interested yeah. can do on the international level? Because yeah, it really absolutely. is an international problem. And if there's an international network, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of proposing solutions myself here. So what we're trying to get at is what, Grace Blakely, do you think of the top three measures, like in a really sort of bullet point pithy way that we should be getting going right now in order to change the game on this issue? So, so one, two, three. I mean, I... I I don't like responding to this because, like, I could list policies, this right? This is why you're here. That's why I invited you on. I so. know, but I think listing policies makes people feel more disempowered because they're like, right, okay, we've got... It's almost worse because it's like there's really easy things that we could do, but we can't get them done because we don't have the politicians that will do those things. So, I mean, like, you know, good things that we could do would be, um, I don't know, like uh, removing non-DOM status, um, having a wealth tax, for example. Yep. Um, you know, you just need to kind of put a lot more money into uh, like figuring out who was avoiding and evading tax, put a lot more international support behind um, these, uh, these you know, negotiations that we've had around uh, around corporation tax, you know, if I'm being really pie in the sky, then we need like complete removal of all secrecy when it comes to, um, you know, taxation yep. and, and and money laundering. Um, we'd need something like an alternative minimum corporation tax where like basically it would be like a step up from the, the agree agreement we've just had where, mm -hmm. you know, as a multinational corporation, you have to declare the profits that you've made in every country, your turnover in every country, and then you get taxed based on your activity in every country. Okay. So um, we need global transparency, yeah, global agreements on taxation, and most importantly, stronger campaigning that bolts on to politicians that can champion those. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really what the Tax Justice Network said, the kind of ABC thing, yep. um, which is, um, so, okay, so country by country reporting is the C, mm -hmm. um, which is really about um, making sure that corporations show what they're making, where they're making it. Right. Beneficial ownership is the B. So making sure that, you know, these rules, these secret um you know, these, these rules around secrecy are kind of undermined so that you know who is the beneficial owner of a company, yeah. regardless of where it's set up. And, and automatic punish exchange countries, of information. Punish countries that, that try and... Yeah, bring the... bring to bear pressure on countries that don't do that. And actually what's interesting is that some of, most of, I think actually most, yeah, most of the biggest um, sinks for, uh, for dodgy money are linked to the UK in one way or another. So out of the top 10, it's like four are either overseas jurisdictions or crown dependencies mm. of the UK. So there is a lot of pressure so that could be brought to bear on, on those. On the plus side, we're in the right place exactly. in order to start making change. So for those people watching and thinking, this winds me up, this needs to get fixed, I want mm. to get involved, what would you advise? So I think... Um, start getting involved with campaigns that are already taking place. So as I said, check out Tax Justice UK Tax and the Tax Justice, Justice Network. UK. The Tax, Tax Justice, Justice Network, Network is okay. already uh, an international campaign that works okay. across the world. Um, we need to start putting pressure on our politicians over this issue. So that means, you know, actually, as I would always say, joining the Labour Party, joining the Labour movement as well. Actually, often when, you know, Labour What about Lib Dems? What about Green? Yeah, Greens, Greens, um, Greens do this as well. I am personally, obviously, a member of the Labour Party. 
full disclosure. I'm a member of my of several trade unions, actually. Um, and I think that a lot of the change that we need to see when it's not being pushed by politicians often comes from the labor movement. So the labor movement often is and has been, you know, if you just look at over the pandemic, some of the biggest voice when it comes to sure, this but stuff. How do you get this movement going within the conservative base? You, because well, otherwise you're just you're just pushing from your end with everyone that agrees. And then the last thing I was gonna say is, you know, we need actual protests about this. We need um people really like advocating that this is an issue that, that I we think care we need about. need some Tory champions. That's what I reckon. I mean I'm again, I'm I'm reticent to believing that any change is really going to come from within the Conservative Party because the Conservative Party is the party that represents the interests of capital, right? This is why I'm a member of the Labour Party. The Labour Party is supposed to be the party that represents the interests of organised labour. It's increasingly not that, as opposed to the Conservative Party, which represents the interests of capital. I just but cannot see a world in which these people champions. think it's in their interests but to challenge But if you had some stuff. champions within there on the moral grounds, look, so, you know... Um, Conservative voters, you were saying, are going to get wound up about this. And there are going to be some conservative politicians that are conservative because they think it, it's better uh, fiscal management than Labour, right? And you just have to take gonna, this. But, but then you're going to come can, up against, this is the point I was making about property earlier, like a lot of the stuff that you would need to do to really stop this stuff happening potentially undermines the interests of not just Conservative Party donors who have a lot of money to stash offshore, but actually potentially Conservative Party voters. So if for any change to happen, you need to build a power base that has a material interest and an ideological conviction that that particular thing needs to change. And, and I don't think don't, that exists within the Conservative Party. Okay, so that's kind of like a challenge. If I could find some Conservative politicians... That would I don't this. doubt that you could find some conservative politicians who would say this is an important issue and we need to challenge it. What but I doubt is that that, that would they're translate make actually into any headway. Yeah, I don't think that, that would translate into systemic change that would actually bring this stuff to an end. Right. But if there was a systemic change from the left and you had some Tory champions and worked together in a cross party way, that could open things, right? Maybe. I don't know if it will happen, but we will have to see. I mean, I don't think that, to be honest, yeah. I mean, I am not optimistic about this stuff changing until we are able to build a much more coherent political block. I would say it's only going to be of, yeah, it's only going to be acceptable to the wider public if they can see some Labour champions, Lib Dem champions and Tory champions staying together and and saying these are issues that need to I be fixed. I actually don't think and that's right. I think it's only going to be They won't see is a party I, political thing. But I don't you think see, it really I think just the, class the problem all is the way the, through. This is But like the problem is not that People are like, oh, there is insufficient cooperation between political parties in this country. The problem is that there is no narrative within which we can understand why this happens and how to change it. I think it's the job of you don't you know, think your progressive view here politicians is too, you don't to think actually your view put together that narrative and really here? say, well, you know, like we had. Kind but of, it has to be acceptable to a wider public, right? But it like the wider public already wants action on this. The wider public already wants action on the wider so public already wants greater public Tories ownership. The wider that, public already wants, you know, like um, uh, to increase taxes on wealth. The wider public already wants massive action on environmental breakdown. But you don't see that happen, even when you have massive polling suggesting that these policies are really popular because. It's not in the interest of the Conservative the Party to interest. do that. Okay. And also because there isn't a narrative and there isn't a, a wider kind of political struggle within which people can kind of get engaged that translates those preferences into a political project. That's what we need to translate people's individual preferences into a coherent political project that aims to kind of take on the status quo. That has bite within that, that uh, political setup. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, been been lovely having you on. And um, check out again the the tax tax justice network, tax justice UK. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those uh, are the two resources that I would start with. Also, read the best book on this, and it's such a good book just to read anyway. Uh, Nick Shackson's Treasure Islands. It's just a really entertaining Ooh, and good read. Good um, I would recommend that one as well. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks so much for for coming here. You may now go back to writing your secret book. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I hope you really enjoyed that show. If you did, of course, share, like, subscribe, and also comment about what you thought and what you would like to see next.